Um, today's lecture is by Professor Chris Perry, who is currently a professor in tropical coastal geosciences at the College of Life, of Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Exeter. Chris received his PhD at the University of Reading, and Dr. Perry is a core reef geoscientist who is also the coordinator of Reef Budget, and that's a census-based method for determining reef carbonate budgets. His research spans a wide range of topics, including coral reef and reef island geomorphology, tropical marine carbonate production, environmental impacts on coral reef growth, and as well as reef and mangrove sediment records of environmental changes. Today, he'll be discussing the recent changes of rates uh, of reef carbonate production and the challenges of measuring the reef derived sediments and generations. And as a reminder to everyone, the chat will be closed until near the end of the presentation, but as soon as it does open up, we welcome a lot of questions based uh, off the presentation, as well as any questions for the professor. So welcome, Dr. Perry, and I'll go ahead and pass over the mic to you. All right, thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, very nice to um, at least virtually see everybody. Um, we were just discussing how these platforms work quite well as a way of reaching a, a kind of broad audience um, in terms of research seminars. Um, Anyway, so yeah, as, uh, as Kimberly said, what I'm going to talk about today is, is a bit of an overview of, of, of really a, a long body of work. Um, the, the, the initial parts of which are really uh, have been focused on trying to understand and measure rates of, of the framework carbonate production uh, in reef systems. Um, and then I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about areas that are, are really still in areas of early development, um, uh, and which I've been working on quite a lot over the last couple of years, um, which are really around trying to better understand uh, rates and types of sediment generation uh, on reef systems and, and sort of trying to build a sort of standardized system for, 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 measuring, uh, for measuring these issues. So this is very much a talk uh, about contemporary um, and, uh, and, and modern carbonate systems and and the processes uh, that, are, that are operating in these rather than a, a kind of strictly rock records based sedimentological talk. Um, so the, the kind of wider background to this um, is, of course, that, that, that the production of carbonate on reefs um, uh, in terms of reef framework and in terms of sedimentary material is fundamentally important uh, and is increasingly recognised as so in the context of uh, the future vulnerability of, of tropical shorelines, uh, and low-lying coral reef islands. And, and this, this is top right here. This is the capital of Mali in the Maldives, which is perhaps the most extreme example of, a, of, a, of an inhabited uh, and low-lying coral reef island. Um, you know, many of those systems are only two, three metres above sea level. Um, and of course, sea level uh, rise is therefore a major threat to, to many of the, the atoll nations. Um, but many tropical shorelines uh, are also very densely populated. A couple of shots at the bottom here of, of, of different sections of the, uh, the Mexican Caribbean coast. And they are equally vulnerable uh, to, to sea level rise uh, and to, to shoreline erosion. Um, and the relevance, I suppose, of what I've been working on and, and, and increasingly working on uh, in this context is, is that, of course, coral reefs provide really uh, important uh, breakwater structures, natural coastal uh, buffers or defense mechanisms that, that can reduce wave energy exposure uh, to islands and, and also along low-lying coasts. Um, but the other side of this is, is that reefs also uh, often represent the only source of material uh, that can be supplied to sustain uh, well, both islands uh, and of course uh, many of the, the, the beaches that, that line these coasts. And so there have been all sorts of estimates in, in the literature of, of the sort of numbers of people that benefit from, from, from these uh, kind of coastal protection gains. I, I won't kind of go, go through all of those, but really just to make the point that, of course, these coastal protection benefits in terms of, of, of reef growth and sediment supply uh, are fundamentally underpinned by the rate at which the reefs are producing carbonate, um, uh, either in terms of the framework uh, or in terms of, uh, of the sediment. And, and in turn, therefore, reef ecology has a major bearing on their, their current performance and, and functionality and what that might look like uh, into the future. Um, and that is, of course, because uh, most carbonate on, on reefs derives either from the production or the conversion of carbonate that's being produced by corals and other organisms into framework material, um, uh, but also into sediment. And you know, we have a good understanding of where most of that stuff comes from. It either comes from the corals, 
uh, or from, from uh, calcareous uh, red and green algae. Um, and we also know a lot about the processes that break down and denude this framework, you know, the role of various organisms such as parrotfish and urchins and endolithic sponges. Uh, you know, so the, these, these processes are really critical to, to reef building in terms of the framework, but also to sediment supply that I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but of course, it's also the case that reef ecology um, and therefore the processes associated with carbonate production are changing very rapidly. Uh, you know, we've known for the last really four to five decades that the, the, the spatial footprint and the extent of the ecological change on reefs has been increasing rapidly. Um, some of that is driven by or has been driven by the loss or the extraction of keystone species, diseases that affected diadema populations in the Caribbean, good example. Uh, increasingly heavy extraction of herbivorous fish, which play a really key role in regulating reef health, um, but also a host of other uh, factors to do with coral diseases that have been very prevalent in the Caribbean, predator outbreaks, uh, such as the crown of thorn starfish, uh, broad, often regional declines in water quality. Again, much of the Caribbean is very heavily affected by poor water quality and eutrophication. Um, and of course, the, the ever growing uh, and increasing threat from sea surface temperature anomaly events um, and, and from coral bleaching. So these are all very well documented. Um, and so in many regions, uh, you know, clearly the, the global spatial footprint of the, the nature of these changes is, is a bit variable. Um, but if we take the Caribbean as an example, uh, you know, we know that coral cover has been declining since at least the mid 1970s and it's come down very, very dramatically. Um, over that time. Uh, and associated with that, we've also seen uh, a progressive flattening uh, of, of the reef systems. And I'll explain why that, those two things are really important in a moment. Um, and this has been accompanied by a loss, a lot, a loss of, of, of really many of the major uh, historically, geologically important um, reef building taxa in this region. So the Elkhorn Coral Aquifora Palmata um, and the Staghorn Coral Aquifora Service Cornice have been largely uh, exterminated um, from, from many of these reefs. And so if you look at those sorts of habitats today, they clearly look uh, very, very different than they would have done, you know, perhaps 60, 70, 80 years ago even. Um, now, there are, of course, you know, a, a whole wealth of ecological biodiversity impacts and implications of these changes, but there are also um, major impacts upon the geoecological functions that, that, that reefs can perform. Um, they have a bearing on the capacity uh, for reefs to be able to respond to rising sea levels. Um, high rates of, of coral, or high coral cover, high carbonate production rates are really the minimum we need to sustain growth on, on many reefs. And, and as I'll show you in a moment, that's, that's increasingly threatened. Um, and the impact of that, of course, is, is not that reefs will drown, um, but the, the water depths above reefs will increase, and that, of course, exposes shorelines to, to greater wave energy uh, and so on. Um, the loss of corals, but particularly many of these architecturally complex corals, is also really important uh, because we know that they play uh, an important role uh, in terms of the frictional benefits uh, that they provide, which, again, is very important in terms of, of, of wave energy propagation across the reefs. Um, and many of these changes in ways that we don't really fully understand yet are likely to change the rates uh, and types of sediment that are being produced on reefs. And, and I've indicated why that's so important earlier on. Um, so really, uh, you know, I think there's a strong case to be made that the data on, on the nature of these changes on the rates and magnitudes of shifts in reef growth potential and in sediment supply are really important in terms of trying to predict and better understand how these environments may change. Um, into the future and lots of implications for understanding coastal vulnerability. Um, so I'm going to deal with, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, what has been a big body of work over the last about 14, 15 years, um, which uh, many of you may know about, but if not, I'll provide a brief overview of, um, and that's to do with really trying to better understand changes in carbonate budgets um, and, and in reef growth potential uh, globally. Um, and a lot of this derives from uh, the Reef Budget Program project that, that, that I set up, um, uh, which is a census-based system, um, which drew on various established ecological surveying protocols, but augmented this with 
a whole suite of additional data that we've, we've progressively collected over the years. It's really trying to kind of produce a sort of standardized uh, survey def based methodology um, that, that could be used. And we've used it um, uh, at all sorts of different locations globally. It's been taken up by NOAA as part of their annual monitoring program and another of, of, uh, a number of other um, uh, monitoring agencies uh, globally as well. Um, it is a, a census-based system, so it draws on and, and adapts and utilizes, as I said, many established um, marine ecology surveying protocols, which we've tweaked and adjusted. Um, the idea being that we have a methodology that can key in to uh, other uh, ecological monitoring programs that, that, that are underway. Um, so it collects data on the abundance of, 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 of different taxa in the reef systems, both producers um, and eroders, and it then uses ideally locally measured, but also published uh, rates where those aren't available to drive estimates, uh, to spreadsheet based model, uh, to drive estimates of, of production from corals and, and coralline algae. Um, and what it churns out at the end are, are, are numbers on net rates of production um, and contributions from different coral groups and different functional types of coral taxa um, and so on. So uh, if people are interested in this, there's a, there's a whole website where you can download all the, the, the handbooks and, and the field protocols and the, and the spreadsheets, but I'm very happy to um, uh, answer any questions uh, that people may have about this, um, this methodology. Um, as I alluded to, increasingly, we've been trying to move beyond relying on sort of regional average data sets um, uh, and trying to kind of, uh, uh, we've been pushing really all along, but um, we've been putting a lot of effort into trying to collect locally appropriate data for the sites that we're working on. And we can do that in all sorts of different ways. So we've been using um, time series photogrammetry approaches to get very detailed data on uh, the growth rates uh, of different coral taxa. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, small scale local collections to look at uh, the density of corals, which we also need to know about for, for calcification estimates. Um, deployment of tiles to look at CCA uh, production rates. Um, deployment of blocks to look at endolithic erosion rates uh, on a site specific basis. And then a lot of effort really going in to try to, to better parameterize models for estimating um, uh, urchin, uh, but particularly parrotfish uh, erosion rates, because these are often the, the, the key eroders in, uh, in, in many systems that we work on. Um, so those approaches have now supported uh, you know, a significant amount of, kind of cross-regional um, assessments of, of carbonate budget states. This, this figure comes from a paper that we, that we brought out in 2018, which is a sort of synthesis of, of all the work that we've done over the previous about 10 years. Um, and it shows the uh, estimates of net carbonate budget states uh, at the top here for a whole suite of locations right the way around the, uh, the sort of Caribbean tropical Western Atlantic region. Um, and then in a suite of sites that we've uh, worked at in the Indian Ocean. Um, you can see there's quite a lot of spatial variability um, in general. Um, rates are extremely low in the sort of northern parts of the Caribbean and along the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef. Uh, they have historically or recently been somewhat higher uh, down in the southwest uh, around the Netherlands, Antilles and so on. Um, very variable in different parts of the Indian Ocean. Some of this is influenced a little bit about by when we were surveying um, because there's a big strong footprint of some of the recent bleaching events at some of these sites. But, you know, the bottom line here is that the, the, the sort of net budget states are pretty low uh, across all of these regions, and they are uh, significantly below uh, those that were associated or reported to be uh, defining high coral cover states uh, in some of the earlier review papers uh, that, that were produced on, on this topic. So many reefs are either uh, in, in a situation where they're, they're not really producing very much net new carbonate, um, and in some cases actually shifting to, to net negative budgets, so starting to, uh, to erode. Um, the other thing that we've been doing, uh, and uh, in a number of locations, uh, mainly in the Central Indian Ocean, um, in the Maldives, southern sites of the Maldives, but also in Chagos, is looking at the effects of thermal stress events uh, on carbonate budgets. Um, so this is from uh, some sites, five, five reef sites that we've been monitoring um, down in uh, down in the southern, very southern part of the Maldives down here, which were affected by the big, uh, the, the really strong bleaching uh, or temperature anomaly event and subsequent bleaching 
uh, that, that happened uh, in the early part of 2016. Um, and the effect of this, I won't go into too much of the detail, uh, it's all published stuff, but you know, effectively you can see that coral production rates decline very, very significantly um, at all of these sites. Um, and the more recent data that we've got, we, we're due to go back to do, um, do a fifth set of surveys at these sites fairly soon. Um, very few of these have, have, have really uh, recovered significantly uh, up until the last sampling date that we had. Um, you know, so these are driving, these sort of climate change related events are, are driving really very substantial changes um, in the budgets uh, of, of reefs. And there are a number of reasons why that all uh, is becoming particularly important that I'll, um, that I'll allude to um, in a moment. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we can do with this data, excuse me, is to use it as a, a baseline for getting a handle on the growth potential of reefs. And uh, to this end, we've, we've used some of the, the approaches that were developed in, you know, by some of the early workers on these, these um, issues, Smith, Kinsey, Hopley, and so on, in their kind of classic papers from the, the late 70s, uh, 80s, and 90s. Um, converting uh, the budget data, um, but incorporating also some estimates of sediment incorporation, um, to derive a, a, an estimate of, of what we've called maximum uh, reef accretion potential. Um, so these take account of the, the, the stacking porosity of different types of coral communities. Um, and actually, this is something I think that the, um, uh, you know, maybe the sedimentological community might be able to provide some interesting information on. I'm very keen to get hold of uh, good quality uh, outcrop images where you can see different corals to look uh, at the sort of stacking porosity that we can measure um, uh, in, uh, in different field locations. Um, but we call this a maximum because we, we, we don't have any data at the moment to, to sensibly factor for physical framework removal rates, so those associated with hurricanes, cyclones and so on, um, and we don't have any uh, reef front chemical uh, dissolution rates that we can, um, that we can use um, as well. So it's, a, it's an interesting approach. Um, you know, I think the valid question is how meaningful are those the numbers that come out of this, this model. Um, I think that it works pretty well, actually. If you take a kind of a high cover system, lots of high rate, fast growing uh, cropper, for example, and a budget of about 10 kilograms, that works out at a, a, an accretion rate of about seven millimeters per year. Um, a low coral cover system, low budget, uh, about one millimeter per year. And that, that would be pretty typical of the sort of range that's reported from a lot of Holocene uh, core studies um, that we uh, that, that we can find um, uh, in the literature. So I think it gives us a reasonably uh, good estimate of, uh, of, of what's going on at the present time. Um, and we use that in this same 2018 paper to kind of uh, look at uh, projections of, of what's going on in terms of reef accretion potential globally at all the sites we had data for. Um, and really, I suppose the key thing to note here is that what we really want in terms of reefs having some capacity uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, as, a, as a sort of optimistic high-end projection of growth rates, um, you know, we need lots of these dark sites with lots of these dark blue circles where accretion rates are above three millimeters per year, which has been the you know the kind of global uh, mean rate of sea level rise over the last about twenty to thirty years. Um, but you can see that many of them uh, are far lower than this, and, and some of them uh, indeed are, are showing evidence of a, a net uh, net framework loss. Um, so that, is, that is, you know, is very worrying, obviously, in terms of sea level rise projections. I think the other really alarming thing is that if you look at the projections of future bleaching frequency um, for many parts of the world, um, without very, very urgent and rapid action on CO2 emissions, we are likely to be seeing um, annual onset bleaching by the middle to the to later part of the, uh, the, the century, depending on which RCP type scenario that you look at. And you know, our work in the Maldives and Chagos has shown that the, the, these events devastate the budgets of reefs. And if the recovery intervals are being reduced down to, you know, one, two, three years, the, the chances for the systems to rebound and respond are going to become increasingly compromised. Um, so that's a kind of whistle stop tour through through that kind of body of work. Um, the other thing I really want to kind of talk to, to, the, to you as a community about is what I've been doing more recently, um, spending an increasing amount of time thinking about approaches to, and that is trying to get a better handle on um, measuring and estimating sediment uh, generation rates from reefs. Um, 
you know, we know where most of this sediment uh, comes from. You know, we only have to look in fin sections of beaches, islands, you know, recent carbonate sediments. You know, we know what most of the constituents are, but trying to link what we know is being produced to, to an estimate of a rate of production uh, on a reef is, is another issue altogether. Um, so conceptually, you know, great understanding of what the producers are. We know quite a lot, and we're adding more data to this uh, in terms of the sort of breakdown pathways that, that different producers undergo, and sort of grain size fractions that things are likely to contribute to post-mortem. Um, and of course, you know, there's been a wealth of studies where people have tried to, to quantify different uh, components and, and in some cases put together entire uh, biogenic uh, sediment production budgets from a whole different suite of sites over, over very many decades. So I'm not sitting here claiming that I'm the first person to think about some of this stuff, um, but I have been trying to think about how we can build on and use these previous approaches with new data to build a, a largely non-destructive uh, census-based system that we can link into to what we've been doing uh, with reef budgets. Um, you know, the other part of this, of course, and why it's particularly relevant, um, is that we know that reef ecology fundamentally controls the amount and the type of sediment that is being produced, you know, not only in terms of the constituent types, um, but also in terms of the, the, the size classes of material that, that are being produced. Um, you know, and I think it follows, therefore, that as the ecology of these systems change, either through, you know, as we can see here, loss of live coral cover, reductions in the number of fish, particularly if they're functionally important, you know, parrot fish and so on. So, you know, we're likely to see changes in the, the production and the types of sediment constituents that are being produced and, and therefore can be supplied uh, to, to shorelines uh, and islands and so on. Um, so I've been trying to kind of think about how we use all this existing knowledge and, and use it to, to try to better estimate sediment production. Um, and so, as I say, I've been trying to sort of develop a, a sort of census based system to run alongside reef budget that will give us some information on the amount of, of new carbonate being produced from all of these uh, different producer groups that we know can be important in, in, in one or environment or another. Um, but also what that then means in terms of the, the grain size contributions. Um, and that's really important, of course, in terms of how this material may behave hydrodynamically and its potential either to be entrained and moved on shore, you know, lost off reef, incorporated in the reef, um, and so on. So we've used some of the similar sorts of approaches for some of the groups that I'll explain in a moment that we're using reef budget, but I've also been pulling together and developing new approaches for, for, for some of these, um, the, these other groups. Um, so for some groups, particularly uh, the bioeroding parrotfish and the urchins, that is a little bit more straightforward to, to kind of put together because we can build on the system that we, that we, that we have in reef budget. You know, we know that pretty much everything that goes into a parrotfish is, is, is ingested or into an urchin is, is excreted out the back uh, as sediment. Um, uh, and there's very little evidence and there's no, no published evidence rather of, of, of dissolution taking place in the intestines of parrotfish. So you know, what, what, what's going in is, is, is a fairly good proxy for, for what's coming out. And we have good, lots and lots of data now to parameterize models that allow us to estimate erosion rates um, and therefore uh, by proxy sediment generation rates. Um, and we also have data that's allowing us to then also better understand the, the size classes of sediment that are being produced. So this is a, again, a sort of spreadsheet based model system. Uh, it's in, as I say, it's in its sort of pilot uh, stages of development at the moment. This is the front end of the sheet for parrotfish. Um, but we've been doing a lot of work over the last few years, trying to kind of better understand the relationships for a whole suite of, of, of common parrotfish species. These are all Indian Ocean species, um, but looking at the key parameters that control erosion rates for different sizes of fish, so bite rates per minute, the numbers of bites that lead scars, the sizes of the scars, the scar volumes. Um, so this allows us to build much, much better models to, to estimate from survey data how much erosion and therefore how much sediment production is taking place. Um, and alongside that, we've also been doing work trying to better understand the, the different grain sizes of sediment that are excreted by parrotfish for, uh, again, uh, a, a range of, of common, in this case, Indian Ocean parrotfish species. So 
this allows us to better predict and, and model both production in terms of the amount, um, but also the size fractions that are being produced. Um, for other sediment generating tanks, so we can build on lots of the, the sort of well-established approaches that have been used. You know, there have been a, a wealth of studies looking at seagrass epiphyte production, um, which is essentially a, a, a function of the, the number of blades per unit area, uh, the turnover rates of, 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 those, uh, of those plants, um, and then the amount of epiphytic carbonate content on the blades. And so we can use those in, in you know, without, without too much uh, complexity to, to come up with some estimates of, of, of production. Um, in other cases, we've had to kind of sort of think a little bit differently about how to do this, largely to avoid the need for going and doing whole scale removal of plants um, to, to, to look at production rates. And, this has been particularly the case for calcareous algae. Um, and what I've developed here, uh, this is published back in 2019, is an approach uh, to uh, use measurable in-field measurable dimensions of different types of calcareous green algae. So these are metrics that we can measure on sizes and thicknesses and so on in the field. Um, we can use that against, uh, based on some small scale sampling, um, uh, relationships between plant fire volumes and the amount of carbonate they contain. We can stain with alizarin red different algal species and let them grow and then look at the amount of new material that is produced over time. Um, and we can run lots of breakdown experiments to look at the size fractions of material uh, that are being produced. So collectively, we can use these approaches based on things that we measure in the field to come up with, with estimates of production. Um, and so this is a sort of spreadsheet for, for, for Halameda. We populate it with the different species and the various segment volume relationships that we can establish, turnover rates, grams of carbonate per segment, um, and then what you put in is basically is field measured data, and what comes out at the other end is, is an estimate of, of, of carbonate production for the sites that we're working on. Okay, um, And those can then all go into a, a kind of summary sheet which delivers data on the total amounts for the site from all the different producers that are present, so the different sediment grain size fractions is your total amount of carbonate, and you can look at um, uh, the kind of amounts and the percentages coming from different producer groups. So lots still to do on this, uh, but it is now a kind of working uh, model. Um, we've tested it uh, most recently uh, in Chagos at a suite of sites. So this is the sort of first full pilot test of this. Um, it, these rates are still uh, uh, pending, um, so take them with a slight pinch of salt, but it gives you some uh, data, what comes out the other end is data on the mean sediment production rates. So this is for a suite of different sites where we started working. The contributions from different producers, parrotfish, urchins, sponges, halameda, forams, and so on. Uh, and the proportion of contributions for different grain size fractions. So I'm quite excited about the opportunities uh, that this, um, this, is, uh, this is bringing. Um, and there's a lot more work that we're going to be doing uh, on this uh, as we go forward. Um, but that sort of data, really important, I think, in terms of being able to kind of feed into a lot of the modeling that's being done now to better understand shoreline and island vulnerability. So, you know, if that's in the, in the context of flume type experiments, you can potentially start to dose those with appropriate amounts of, of, of sediment based on what you think is or kind of estimated to have been produced uh, within, uh, within a given environment. Um, yeah. Um, finally, um, something that I've been thinking quite a bit about, um, partly triggered by the fact that, well, it was an idea I've had for a long time, but triggered by the lack of fieldwork opportunities during lockdown that I finally had time to spend some time uh, discussing. And that's really thinking about the wider role of fish in, in producing and modifying and cycling um, reefal sediments. Um, you know, we know that fish produce a, a, or perform a wide range of what I would describe as geoecological function roles mixing, transport, fire erosion, some framework modification, um, sediment production, as they ingest and, and mill stuff around in, in their guts. Um, you know, and this has a whole wealth of, of, of kind of impacts on, on, on the sedimentary environments uh, associated with reefs and lagoons and, uh, and so on. So I've been interested in trying to think about how we might try to kind of quantify uh, some of these processes. Um, but uh, is that playing? Yeah. So you know, some of these we know a lot about. There's parrotfish uh, erosion and, and sediment defecation. 
you know, something that's being written about and, and monitored uh, um, and attempting to be quantified for, for long periods of time. So, you know, that is a fundamental process that, that, that we know generates a very large amount of sediment uh, in, uh, in, in some reef systems. So it's a, it's a sort of input into the environment. Um, but fish also play all sorts of other roles. You know, they're, they're responsible, parrotfish again, but not only parrotfish, uh, for significant sediment dispersal. Um, so this is parrotfish sediment being excreted uh, above a reef. There are many fish that rework and forage in sediments for feeding and, and, and so on. There's a huge amount of sediment reworking and mobilization that goes on during nest building, for example. This is a trigger fish. They excavate these enormous nests uh, that they lay their, they, they lay their, their, their eggs in. You know, but collectively, all of these processes are actually really important in terms of, 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 of sediment accumulation and cycling. So not only impacting budgets, sediment production budgets, but in influencing how, how turnover and reworking goes on in these environments. And that's something that has a major bearing on substrate geochemistry um, and uh, a, a very significant effect, I suspect, on the fidelity of, of, of the sediment record. You know, we, we, you know, we, we know that various attacks of overturned sh burrowing shrimps and so on will, will cause significant bioturbation and reworking of, of, of the sediments. But if you look at the, the numbers of fish uh, on most reefs and, and in most lagoons that actually uh, forage, mix, rework sediments, you know, the, the whole of that upper surface layer of, 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 uh, in these environments must be very, very continually being, being reworked and remobilized. So, I've been quite interested in this for a long time. Uh, we've, we've started to kind of pull together as much rate data as we can for, for the species that we know about that contribute to, to these processes. Um, and then coming up with some, some estimates of, these are kind of case study examples from different regions of, uh, across sites of differing uh, fish biomass, uh, really uh, trying to quantify what we know about the roles and contributions that fish are playing to the framework. Uh, modification through fire erosion, framework breakage. Um, I had a lovely video I was going to show you, but I had to take it out because it, it wouldn't stop playing uh, in, in the run through. Uh, in terms of sediment production, sediment reworking, sediment transport, uh, and so on. So this is work that's in review at the moment. And again, it's kind of really a paper that's to kind of get people thinking a little bit about uh, some of these um, some of these processes and why they're important. Um, so um, I'll wrap things up uh, there. I'm happy to take some questions in a minute. I, just in terms of some summary comments, I suppose, in terms of where we are with uh, with, with this sort of wider body of work. Um, in terms of the, the reef budget and, and reef growth side of things, I think we've got a, a, you know, a fairly viable approach. It's been quite widely used now. We're looking at maximum rates of accretion. Um, as I alluded to, there's some, there's some really big data gaps, things that we need to know about. Um, we need to know something about how much material uh, tends to be stripped off reefs during uh, you know, big, big storm, physical disturbance events. That's a big knowledge gap. The whole chemical dissolution issue is also potentially quite significant in terms of budgets. We have data from um, sediment dominated lagoon environments, but I'm not really aware of very much that we can use from, from reef front environments, the sort of framework dominated systems largely because the approaches are quite difficult to apply there. Um, we can use that to make first order estimates of changes in, uh, in reef growth and you know, predict things to do with reef submergence and so on. Um, so, you know, I think that, that work is, is, is developing quite nicely. In terms of the sediment side, um, so this is the big thing that I'm spending a lot of time on at the moment. You know, we know a lot about which taxa and processes produce this sediment. Um, we can do a reasonably good job, I think, for some of these um, taxa now. We've got a lot of data that can go in to inform our models and predictions. Um, we still need to know more, I think, about the sizes of sediment that are generated by different taxa, but we're increasingly adding to that uh, as, as we go along. And the, the spreadsheet system that I've developed and that will eventually go online and we will write about um, has associated tabs with all of the, the published available metrics that can go into these models that, that uh, well, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, there are always some we miss, but that can be added to over time. Um, uh, you know, what we don't yet know very much about 
is, is really uh, how disturbance events are changing sediment supply rates. That's again a kind of uh, another big issue. But we, you know, we can't really get to that until we've got some baseline data to um, to sort of start working with. So um, you know, lots still to do. I think we've made quite a lot of progress in some of these areas. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm very happy to hear any thoughts and ideas that people may have um, and suggestions, uh, particularly on the sediment production side. So uh, I will stop there. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions if, uh, if anybody has any. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Perry. Um, as was stated before and in the chat room, please add any of your questions that um, you would like to ask and please state your name as well as uh, where you're coming from. Um, so, and please make sure that you are sending the chat that's labeled to everyone so we can all see them and then I'll make sure to reiterate them to Dr. Perry. Um, but as far as I think that, I mean, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, do you have any like future next steps? What are your goals for for what the project can become in the next few years? Yeah, so um, well, <laughs> more more of trying to improve, particularly the sediment production side of things. Um, we've got two um, big ongoing projects at the moment. Um, one in uh, one one in Chagos, British Indian Ocean Territory, Chagos, um, and that is really uh, giving us an opportunity to kind of develop. The, the sediment production models much in much more detail out there, but particularly to apply that to, to a number of management questions. There's a lot of work being done in that area, uh, looking at the benefits of rat eradication. Um, and from a management perspective, uh, the, the, the long-term benefit of that is it allows seabird populations to come back. Um, they deliver more balanced nutrient regimes to the reefs through, through their guano and, and the leaching. Um, so we're involved in work out there trying to look at the, the benefits that these, these management interventions may have for, for reef growth, but, but also sediment supply. Um, and then we've got a, another big new project starting out in Mexico, actually um, looking at both reef growth, but also sediment generation um, along uh, gradients of ecological degradation. Um, really, the, the, the aim of that is, is to kind of try and look at you know, accepting that reefs in many areas are, are really, you know, quite degraded, what are the functions that we can expect them to, to deliver? Uh, and what might we gain by, if you like, sort of small incremental improvements that might be possible through, through various um, management interventions. So, you know, the, 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 the posts that are going, uh, uh, people will be working on those projects. So, you know, one of the things they will be focused on will be improving our, you know, I'm having a big push at the moment on local metrics to, to kind of try and improve the sort of site specific estimates that we have. So, you know, I think those are, those are a couple of kind of big areas that we'll be, we'll be looking to push and develop um, over the next few years. Um, Absolutely. Standardizing certain measurements and collections and, and protocols is definitely a, a best way forward of how to measure a lot of these reef systems around the world. Yeah. Um, thank you. We have a question from Stephen Lokier from Derby in the UK. So thanks, Chris, for such an excellent presentation. Maybe I missed it, but a quick question about those critters munching on the reefs. Do you have any um, handle as to how much the reduction in grain size with inherent increase in the surface area affects the potential for uh, sin depositional diagenesis or dissolution or anything else of those standards? Yeah, excellent question, Steve. Um, cast my mind back to the things I used to spend my time thinking about when I worked on sediment diagenesis. Um, but actually, um, uh, that the, the, the diminution that goes on, well, you know, I suppose, A, you've got the stuff that's ingested new, um, and that's milled, and some of that will come out as, as very fine grain material with high surface area. Um, but they also do rework sediment. They take in sediment that's already been deposited in some of the uh, the turf and so on. And again, that will be milled down. So that is likely uh, to fairly significantly increase dissolution rates when it's going into sediment bodies that are inherently undersaturated. So I suppose when that's going into these big open mix systems, which have been the, those that have been shown to kind of um, uh, see the highest uh, grain dissolution rates, then I think that, that could potentially be quite significant. 
you know, but people like Lynn Waters and so on did some really nice work on you know kind of surface area and, and grain size distribution. If my memory serves me correctly, that's a gift. Uh, Great, think thank you. Um, we have another question from John Reiner in, in Amsterdam. Hi, Chris. Thanks for the very insightful talk. What will be the impact of higher nutrient input in the sediment production budget as parrotfish will avoid regions with a high algal turf cover? Very good question, John. And I'm not sure there is a simple answer to that, um, mainly because I don't really know. Um, I think, you know, this is actually really, it would be a very interesting be a very interesting issue to explore um, and it's not something that I haven't I mean, there's too many too many double triple neg negatives there it's something I have thought about uh, I've been very interested in the whole idea of changing seascapes and what that does I've mainly been thinking out about it from an endolithic erosion perspective actually because as seascapes change and the proportions of different types of substrates change either in terms of you know what types of, of corals and their densities change or the amount of cryptic space um, that might be available, what that might do to the prevalence and abundance of uh, you know, different endolithic communities. But actually, that's a really interesting point about you know, what, what nutrients do to, to the composition of the substrates. There's been a lot of work recently coming out that shows that um, uh, parrotfish seem to be targeting substrates to um, feed on the endolithic microorganisms. So, uh, the microboring communities in particular. Um, and those we know respond quite significantly to nutrient loading. Um, so the changes that might come about associated with those changes are likely to result in perhaps shifts in parrotfish grazing pressure in some environments um, uh, or, or reductions in others. So, you know, it may have a, a positive or a negative uh, result. And there, there seems to be quite good evidence that certain fish are targeting particular types of substrates with particular types of endoliths. How that plays out at a, a reef scape scale is, is, is a whole other issue. But it's a, that's a really interesting question, actually. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Marlene Stuhr from Bremen. Hi, Chris, thank you very much for the talk. Really interesting especially the thoughts on the sediment distribution. But for the overall production, I was wondering, is also in faunal taxa like mollusks, et cetera, living in the sediments or seagrass rhizomes are considered? Yep. Hi, Marlene. Uh, yes, they are. I gave a bit of a snapshot of, uh, of, a, <laughs> of the many and, and growing number of tabs that exist in the model. Um, so yes, um, bivalves, gastropods are, are included. Um, there's a bit of work to be done there uh, in terms of the production rates. I suspect there's actually far more literature on this than I've had time to find. Um, so there is a working model for that based on counts that I do of the numbers of bivalves and gastropods uh, per unit area, and then using some of Dan Bezenci's production rates that he used in, in Florida at the moment. Um, but yes, seagrass, um, seagrass epibionts, um, and production from those, um, uh, as I think I mentioned. Uh, oh, you mentioned seagrass rhizome. Not sure what you mean by that, um, but certainly seagrass uh, epibiont production uh, is 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 considered. Um, the other thing, that actually, you know, we we I, I, I mentioned urchins. The other thing that actually occurred to me earlier on, because I was actually doing some work on the spreadsheets, um, is that I also need to think about actually inputs from urchin tests. You know, we know if you look at any reef sediment, there's tons of bits of urchin spine and urchin test often in those sediments. So we need to actually also factor not only for what they're eroding and excreting of sediment, but actually uh, what an individual urchin is likely to ultimately contribute uh, in terms of its test and spine. So this is one of those topics that the more you think about it, the more complicated it, uh, it gets and, and the, the, the more cans of worms that you, you tend to open. So I see it a bit like reef budget as very much a kind of work in, um, a work in progress and one that will incrementally get better. It will probably be never, never right, but it will be less wrong over time, which is what I say about reef budget. Absolutely. I mean, I I know the saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it works um, to a point. You know, it, it's extremely. I mean, all the different kinds of variables that are involved here are. It's a tremendous effort to try to even um, start and, and see how it goes. 
Um, but hopefully there'll be an answer soon. Um, we have another question from um, Ramon Mercedes uh, from Barcelona. Fascinating work and approach. I have a question regarding the future of coral reefs due to ocean acidification. Is there any preferred setting that might become more favorable for coral recolonization in the next few years? Hmm. Well, um, I suppose I would preface that by any answer by saying that I think um, most people would probably consider thermal stress events and bleaching the, the, the bigger and more significant and more pressing issue. Um, that's not to say that ocean acidification won't have an effect and it, and it will as we go further out into the future. Um, how corals respond to that is, is a bit of a complicated area actually because there's clear evidence that they are able to, because they're able to upregulate pH at the calcification sites below the polyps. Um, they've been shown to actually, in the experimental studies at least, to actually be quite capable of dealing with, 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 with shifting pH levels. Um, so kind of quite how that's going to play out, I don't know. In terms of more favourable areas, well, we know that ocean acidification is going to be felt more strongly in, in the cold and northerly latitudes. So contrary to this, this idea that warming might allow some uh, lateral uh, expansion north and south, uh, you would imagine that ocean acidification may have the, the opposite effect if it is having a tangible effect on, on recruitment and settlement. I'm not sure I can give you a, a, a much more comprehensive answer than that, I'm afraid, Beth. I Great, think thank you. Answered a different question, actually. But. <laughs> well, well, well. I mean, and we'll see. Hopefully, it did. Um, maybe Ramon can clarify if he needs um, more of a uh, of a description. Um, but we have another question from Mateo Scama. Um, Hi, Chris. Thank you for your presentation. My question is about the magnitude of carbonate sediments production. The parrotfish can contribute with the sediment production in bigger quantities than physical factors like currents, waves, and etc. Uh, mainly thinking of like such things as marine protected areas. Yes, so where we've tried to look at this, and it's not the case in every site, but we've, I've done, I've, we've had some, we had some very early goes at trying to kind of estimate sediment production with some very, well, reasonably crude approaches, similar to those that we use now, but, but with a lot less data to parameterize the models um, in the Maldives. Um, and in that location, and where we've done this more recently in uh, Chagos, in many locations, we do find in, where you've got big parrotfish populations that they tend to be the dominant biogenic producers. Um, it's not always the case. Um, and I'll be really interested actually to see when we start rolling this method out um, later this year, early next year in the Mexican Caribbean, how that plays out. Uh, you know, those systems have far smaller uh, parrotfish populations and they have far less abundant high rate eroding species there. So I would imagine that we're going to see quite significant shifts in the relative proportions of these uh, biogenic producers in, in different systems. Um, so that's sort of part of your question. The other big thing is about how much is produced by physical processes and, and that is really important. At the moment, I can only really meaningfully come up with ways of thinking about I suppose the kind of gravel to sort of sand and downwards size fractions, the stuff that comes from erosion or skeletal inputs, how we sensibly factor for production of rubble and so on from storms and so on is, is, is a really difficult issue, mainly because there's so little data available. I'm only aware of a couple of studies that have really uh, tried to measure um, uh, either the amount of material that's been shed off reefs um, after a cyclone, there's some really early work from Terry Hughes in Australia, and Carl Morgan's done some work in the Maldives comparing physical transport rates to volumes against the amounts that have been estimated uh, in budget studies there. So the whole physical production side of things, which we know is really massively important, um, is, uh, is, is, is a really difficult area. It's something I want to get data on for the, for the budgets, but it also has relevance to to um, uh, for sediment production. Uh, you know, the, the irony actually though is in, in many areas, particularly if you go to many areas of the Caribbean, that whole kind of, uh, well I call it the sort of supply side of the system, 
is being rapidly diminished. We've, we've lost many of the fast, fast growing, high rate carbonate producing um, branching taxa, which generate a lot of the rubble. So even when we have fairly significant disturbance events, hurricanes coming through, the amount of material that's actually available to now to be broken up and transported and, and produced as, as rubble is, is, is diminished significantly. You know, historically, that would have been massively important. And we know that if you just look at most reef deposits, but actually in many areas that, that supply side has, has, has changed fundamentally. So the balance between physically driven production and uh, production that comes from erosion and, 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 and skeletal inputs and so on has probably changed quite a lot in a lot of systems actually. Absolutely, and then when you consider the fact of sea level change um, throughout history, it definitely has an impact on these kinds of production, whether they be biotic or abiotic and different physical elements that are associated with that. So it's not an easy topic um, to discuss reef budgets by any means, or even carbonate budgets in general. Um, Marlene Stewart did have a follow up. Um, she says, thanks uh, for the question. She meant everything that lives below the sediment surface, um, something like taken from short cores. Yeah, yeah. So um, yes, it is the short answer, at least in terms of uh, sampling, uh, essentially sort of simplified little box core samples um, for, for trying to look particularly at informal bivalves and so on. Um, that's one way you can get at that. Um, it depends on the system, of course. So if you're working in a fairly you know, exposed high energy reef front setting, you know, it tends to be a pretty thin veneer of sediment and you can kind of pretty much search around for that. When I've done this sort of work in lagoons, I've, I've tended to take a sort of small box coring type approach and use that as a way of trying to quantify uh, with in situ sitting actually uh, counts of, 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 of informal bivalves and so on. Um, but I'm happy to hear any ideas you might have, Marlene. Absolutely, thanks. Um... For everyone, you'll be able to see this talk online. Are there any more questions? Uh, I'm talking to Marlene on Friday, I think. So. Uh, oh, well, there you go. That's a topic. great discussion starter. So it's do with four hour production. So uh, we can maybe pick this up again uh, on Friday, Marlene. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, so with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for joining us today. Um, and for those of you online, please check in next week's seminars at our regular time at 4 p.m. during the uh, for the UK time for London time. Um, and this is when Chris, uh, Chris Stenenson will be presenting on meteorites and mass extinctions. Uh, so you can view the full abstract on the SEDS online website. And you don't need to register again for any of the future seminars, sem seminars if you have registered already and attended. So we hope to see you then. Thanks, everyone.